Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the channel, Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, and I recap live trials while I'm crafting, except I usually do the crafting while I'm listening to the trial, which is what you see up in the corner, because I can't craft and talk at the same time. We're currently covering the Chad Daybell trial day 27, and John Pryor, the defense attorney, is doing his darndest to put on a defense for his client, Chad Daybell. Chad is charged with the murders of Tylee Ryan, J.J. Vallow, and Tammy Daybell. Also conspiracy to commit those murders and insurance fraud. And so far, um, we after yesterday, we'd heard from quite a few defense witnesses. I'm not, impre I'm not impressed with the defense. Like... I've heard nothing to defend him from the murders of Tylee and JJ and very little to defend him from the murder of Tammy. I, I just don't know where John Pryor's going with all this testimony he's offering. Anyway, got some crayon, broken crayons here today because broken crayons still color. Yes. Anyway. So yesterday they started the day out with a cross-examination of Joseph Murray, who is Chad's son-in-law. He's married to Emma Murray Daybell. They have three kids. They've been married for seven years, and they are now living in Chad Daybell's house. So this was a cross-examination, and uh, he said that uh, he met Lori the day after Tammy's death. Funeral. The day after her funeral, he met Lori. What? Yep. And uh, I, I, I wasn't impressed. I, like there was nothing that stood out to me about this cross examination, but there was there was some discussion uh, regarding this officer deputy cannon that came out to investigate the, the attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell on October 9th. Apparently, he, there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, he, it's Joe and Emma's testimony that he came in the house and Tammy showed him, she had Googled, you know, paintball gun and she showed him what she saw. Um, he denies that. He had, he has taken the stand previously and he denies ever being, you know, seeing this. And then the other thing is he wrote in his report what Joseph thinks to be totally inaccurate. So listen to this conversation. You testified also that at some point in time, Detective from seal had been seen driving by this property. Yep, before and after Chad's arrest. And that was something that you had observed personally? Yep. And at that point, had you met Detective from seal Yes. And that's how you were able to identify him? Yep. And I've also seen him on Facebook. Okay. Um, Did you see Detective from seal the day that Tylee and JJ were found? Um, I can't recall for sure on that day. You don't have any reason to disagree that Detective from seal was one of the lead investigators in this case? No, I have no reason to disagree on that. No reason to disagree that, in fact, he was there the day that the bodies were found? I would assume so. So you wouldn't disagree that for law enforcement to drive back and forth by this property that they may have suspected the bodies were and in fact found the bodies there that that wouldn't necessarily be unusual would it perhaps no however uh this was even after the bodies were taken out that he would slowly drive by the property and to that point so you would disagree that a detective who discovers bodies on a property arrest somebody from the property might have a surveillance or investigative interest in continuing to drive by the property to identify if someone else was coming back to the property after the bodies had removed you don't disagree with that do you i don't see the reason for it you're not a law enforcement officer are you um absolutely not i would rather choose any other profession okay choose any other profession he would rather be 
anything else other than a law enforcement officer. The other thing it was, and I don't, in the grand scheme of things, I don't know how this defends Chad Daybell. I really don't. I, I, I don't, I just don't. Anyway, the, um, he talked about Ray Hermosillo, Officer Ray Hermosillo, who was the lead detective on this case, driving by all the time. He drives by all the time. So who cares? What do you care? Um, that's what I'm thinking. You know, as a juror, I'm thinking, so who cares? Uh, it, you know, before, afterwards, I think the long story short is these kids feel, including their spouses, feel like the law enforcement had had it out for Chad Daybell. Like they were just going to get him no matter what. Uh, they were going to pin these murders on those children who were found in your backyard. We're going to pin these murders on you. He says, oh, no, even after the kids were found, you know, yes, we, we, you know, he was still driving by. So what? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, with respect to the money, apparently each of Chad Dable's five children got $8,000. But, and this was brought out on cross-examination, and it's something I had said yesterday, Um all of the kids got the $8,000. But in addition to that, when he was arrested, he told Emma there's $9,000 of cash in the house. Get that. So Emma got the $8,000 and the $9,000 cash. And Joe said, yeah, she got that. Okay. So the next person on the stand was Dr. Kathy Raver. She is a forensic pathologist who does not actively practice forensic pathology. What did I say? Did I say psychologist? Forensic pathologist. Yeah. A medical examiner. She doesn't practice medical examination. She does consulting. In other words, this is the hired gun lady. This is the expert that people hire to contradict what's on, what the, the medical examiner is saying in whatever case they have. And it was never discussed, which I'm, I find interesting. Like, how much are you make? I certainly would have done this. How much do you make per hour? And how many hours did you spend on this case? Um, and how much are you billing? Are you billing that from the time you left your house till the time till you get back to your house? All those hours? Because that's, I'll bet you that, yeah. For all the time she had to wait to sit on that stand, for every meeting she had with a lawyer, for everything that she reviewed. Speaking of everything she reviewed, we're going to get to that. So, she did say she reviewed the autopsy report and photos for Tammy Daybell. This had nothing to do with the kids. This is Tammy Daybell. She reviewed the coroner report, uh, the police reports, the uh, photos from the scene uh, that morning at the house when Tammy Daybell died. She did not look at any medical records. Yes. No. None at all. So her findings were that she had non-specific bruising. Well, what do you mean by non-specific bruising? Well, meaning we don't know what the cause was. And honestly, I did not find that her findings were that different than the original medical examiner's findings. They came to different conclusions, but they saw the same things. Okay, we see bruising. She just wasn't willing to say the age of the bruising, you know, none of that, because she didn't get to look under the microscope, but, and nobody asked her that. You don't know how the age of that bruise, you didn't look under the microscope, right? So she said there was no anatomical cause of death. Nothing was wrong with her anatomy. Heart was good, lungs were good, everything's hunky-dory. Um, she had an extensive toxicology screen and it was pointed out to the jury toxicology the lab is only going to test what you tell them to test for so there could have been substances even though this was very extensive there still could be substances out there that weren't tested for but there was no toxicological cause of death so nothing to explain her cause of death in the toxicology uh and then she's uh she did not agree that it was asphyxia because asphyxia is 
can be due to anything. It could be due to drowning. It could be due to cyanide. It could be due to some other kind of poisoning. It could be due to smothering. It could be due to hanging a pillow, uh, any of those things. So I guess her beef with the term asphyxia from the original medical examiner is that she didn't say due to whatever. And since you can't say what it's due to, that can't be a cause of death. And the other medical examiner did say asphyxia is a diagnosis of exclusion. Like once you've ruled out everything else, which is what this expert has done, ruled out everything else, you got as asphyxia. And no one, neither, cro neither the prosecution or defense ever asked this woman, what about the pink foam coming out of her mouth? What did you think of that? Wouldn't that indicate asphyxia? She didn't have anything else wrong with her lungs, right? So she said that it could, her death could have been caused by a number of things, either seizures, though she didn't review anything that said she had seizures or anybody that said she had seizures. It could be due to arrhythmias of the heart um, or top, toxic substances that weren't tested, tested for or the asphyxia due to whatever. Now, what the original medical examiner that did the autopsy said is that, yes, it could be a seizure, but it's very highly unlikely. Yes, it could be an arrhythmia, but it is highly, very unlikely in a woman this age. So they're, they're pretty much saying the same thing, but this woman, this expert's like trying to put a different spin on it. So to affect, uh, she said no scientific evidence of the cause of death. Okay. So then on cross-examination, she was also asked about confirmation bias. And uh, she said, so this is where like you hear and you read certain things and then you're like, oh, that explains what I saw. Okay. So that, that, so it's probably this. And she said, you know, here's what Lindsay Blake did on cross-examination. Listen to this and other pertinent information. It was the defense that provided you that other pertinent information. Is that correct? Uh, the defense provided me everything, yes. Did you review a report from Lieutenant Powell regarding requesting Walmart records? Uh, that does not sound familiar, but I don't remember. Did you review a report of an interview with Emily Daybell? I don't recall. Did you review a, a report of an interview with Paul Daybell? I don't recall. Did you review a report of an interview with Jana Penrose, a relative of Tammy Daybell? I don't believe so. Did you review a report of an interview with David Warwick? I don't believe so. The name's not familiar. And you said you reviewed some of the coroner reports. Would that be Brenda Dye? Does that name sound familiar? It does sound familiar. Like I said, one was not signed. I didn't know who wrote it, but, but that name does sound familiar. Did you review an interview that was conducted with Brenda Dye, a report of that? I believe so, yes. Did you review a report of an interview conducted with the deputy coroner, Cammie Wilmore? Yes, I believe so. Did you review a report that contained some records from a Lolly Time iCloud account? No. Did you review a report from Benjamin Dean, an analyst with the FBI? No. Did you review the Seasons medical records? No. Did you review the Teton medical records? No. And I think you indicated you did review some reports of the October 9th incident? Yes. And that would have been uh, regarding an attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Did you review a report of an interview with Matthew and Regan Price? I don't believe so. Did you review a report of an interview with Haley Palmer? No. Did you re review any reports of interviews with Angela Yancey? No. Did you review a report of an interview with Ronald and Phyllis Douglas? Judge, I'm going to object at this point to the relevance of, a, of how that would have an impact on the autopsy. She's going to go down a list of every report that any witness in this case uh, discussed. Uh, no speaking objections, please, but I'll sustain the objection at this point unless there's some specific relevance to the autopsy. And if I may respond? Go ahead. 
I'm reading off a list that was reviewed by the Utah medical examiners in making their findings. Okay. I think it is relevant. All right. If that's the foundation for that, I'll allow that to continue. Thank you, Ms. Blake. So after this whole laundry list, and here's what I think, here's what I think happened in real life, IRL. When you have an expert, when you have a medical examiner, send them everything, especially with, you know, you're the prosecution, you're not paying them, send them everything, you know, a lot of those things she read off were witnesses that were testifying to her health were testifying to things that they'd seen, discussions that they had had with her, training for the 5K, all these. She didn't review any of that. And uh, would it have provided some explanation for her death? Probably not. You know, it, it, it is what it is. We don't know why she died. But since everything was ruled out, we're going to go with asphyxia. Now, she was asked about by John Pryor, well, what about sitting on somebody's chest? Now, why would you bring that up? Nobody has brought that up in the trial. No one has said somebody sat on this woman's chest. And she goes, that's very unlikely that she would asphyxiate from somebody sitting on her chest. What I think may have really happened is that she's so they're sitting on her chest. Someone sat on her chest and someone else smothered her because she was asked on cross-examination. Well, what if it was two people? Yeah, it could happen with two people. It could. Score one for for the defense now uh, for the prosecution. So here's another thing. Uh, so I, was, I started to tell you about real life. So you you send everything to your expert if you're the prosecution. If you were the defense, you're not going to send them all that stuff that she read off because she's going to read it every single bit of it, and then she's going to charge you out the ass for it. Probably, I'm going to say probably minimum $400, $500 an hour, minimum, to read all that stuff. And it's not going to change your opinion. So why send it to her? I don't know that the jury knows that. I'm just telling you. This is how it is. All right. So one of the things that came out, and I, honestly, I heard, I, I missed this. I heard Nate Eaton from East Idaho News talking about it. I heard uh, Lauren from Hidden True Crime talk about it. So I'm going to play this for you. I had to actually find it on the video because I, I don't remember hearing it. It was that, I don't know if the jury is going to even caught it. Listen here. Dr. Raven, um, Ms. Blake went over a litany of other reports and statements from other witnesses, uh, a variety of other documents. When, when a forensic pathologist um, is examining a variety of other documents that are not related to the medical reports and the scientific evidence, is that an example of confirmation bias? Objection, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. Overruled. Is that an example of confirmation bias when you take into account all of these other reports, documents, statements of people who are not present at the murder? Yeah, he says murder murder whoops uh-oh yeah not not good all right next witness regan price she's one of the neighbors she lives south of chad daybell across the street from where joseph and emma used to live and uh she, she wasn't 18 minutes she was on the stand. And most of that 18 minutes that she was on the stand, John Pryor, the defense attorney, is trying to figure out how to work his computer. And everybody's up there helping him. <laughs> so we could play a two-minute clip where she is telling some reporter or interview, I don't know who she was talking to, they never said, that she had heard a gunshot. She doesn't remember when she heard this gunshot. On cross-examination, they narrowed it down to prior to September 9th, but she doesn't know if it was September 9th. All she could narrow it down to was it was in the morning because she hears stuff um, at other times of the day because she has another neighbor that likes to go, go out. She burns and things like that. But on this day, it was kind of unusual and it was very loud. They had their bedroom window open and they heard it. That's it. That was her testimony. Okay. 
So <laughs> moving on. Then we have um, Rick Schmidt. He used to be a detective. He's now retired. Uh, he was not on the stand for more than 14 minutes. I'm going to say 14 minutes total. He was he participated in the excavation of the bodies behind Chad Davidville's house. And his testimony was, weren't you handed a shovel and told, go dig and find something? Yes. Okay. So, moving on. Next witness. I didn't get that one. What, what was, I didn't get the significance. If you know the significance of that, let me know. I mean, and he did explain, I took the shovel and I was told to look, you know, there were no boundaries, just look around the property. If you see anything that looks out of place, like, you know, somebody's dug there or, you know, the vegetation looks different or the ground is a different text, you know, then dig and see what you find. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next, then we have a guy named... He's the Idaho Attorney General, and I cannot pronounce his last name. You got to roll your R's, I think. Whatever. Um, his first name was Asmir. He was on the stand for 10 minutes, 10 minutes to talk about a three and a half to four hour interview that he had with Melanie Gibb. And the purpose of this interview was he just had a whole lot of questions about these Chad's teachings or this religious belief system that they were following. He just had a lot of questions. And um, he said that she indicated that Chad and Lori also believe the same thing. So I guess John Pryor took that to mean, well, they're, you know, so she didn't get her information from Chad. She, are, she already believed this. And then they came along and they believed the same thing. But then she admitted she later on she was a follower of Chad's. Then when the interview was over, uh, he just asked, because she said she could discern light from dark. So he asked her, am I light or dark? And she said, oh, you're light. You have a light aura around you. So she didn't have to call Chad to get that information is the point, I guess, of that testimony. Yeah. And that was it for the day. Like these people were on and off the stand, on and off the stand. That's it. That's all I have to report. <laughs> all right. Have a great day today. And I will see you uh, tonight. I'm doing Crafting and Crime Daily Live, where I do my Craft With Me Wednesday. It's a crafting show. And I'll probably be doing some cross stitch and taking your questions and just chit chatting. So uh, that is at 7 p.m. Central Time. And if I don't see you there, I'll see you tomorrow for day 28 of this trial. Take care, everybody. Bye.